Well, thank you all for joining us today for HydroTerra's webinar. We've got a fantastic turnout today. It's over 400 registrants. So congratulations to Susie for drawing such a big crowd. Um, today's topic is about microplastics in soil. Need more attention, but why? Our presenter today is Susie Reichman and she's director of CAPM. And I've got some more details about Susie shortly. All right, there's a picture of Susie for you. So, Susie is Associate Professor at the University of Melbourne and she's Director of the Centre for Anthropogenic Pollution Impact and Management, better known as CAPM. Her role is really to reinvigorate CAPM to include water, soil, air and waste related pollution. From 2010 to 2020, she was a senior lecturer and associate professor in the School of Engineering at RMIT University. Susie has also worked for the Environment Protection Authority in Victoria, the University of California and Lincoln University in New Zealand and graduated in 2002 with her PhD in mining remediation from the University of Queensland. Susie is an expert in soil chemistry and ecotoxicology, and her research aims to reduce the risk of contaminated land to humans and the environment. Her research has been incorporated into government guidelines for deriving background concentrations in soil and for legacy contamination in urban veggie gardens. Susie is currently undertaking research on the impacts of microplastics and PFAS in soil and ecotoxicology research that is helping to establish soil quality guidelines for contamination assessment and remediation in Antarctica. Now, there's a picture of Susie on the right there. Whereabouts are you there, Susie? So that was uh, Richard when we were starting our um, Antarctic research and we went down to Antarctica. Um, to gather samples. And I think I'm there looking at a tardigrade under the microscope. Oh, very good. It's a bit sad to hear that we've polluted uh, Antarctica already. But, um, all right, moving along. So a few administrative matters. So if you would like to raise a question, and we do love you to raise questions, so that is one of the big things that this is about, please use the Q&A button that allows us to keep a record of the questions that have been asked. All right, why does HydroTerra undertake these webinars? Well, we've become increasingly passionate about them. Um, we're seeking to educate the community on the impacts of pollution on the environment and how with better management and monitoring, this can be improved. And so today's presenter is obviously very much aligned with that. We like to share knowledge, we like to facilitate education, and we like to be a bit of an industry leader, making people aware of how things can be done better. Today's presenter is someone who has a huge amount of knowledge in the particular topic, and I feel very lucky to have Susie to present today. So thanks very much, Susie, for doing this. We really got to know Susie during lockdown through about 4,000 uh, Teams meetings. Um, so we're used to doing this. But uh, today's topic um, is really, and the presentation itself is broken up into sources of microplastics in soil and their impacts on the environment. Obviously, there's a lot of detail to get through between those two headings. So without further ado, over to you, Susie. Thank you, Richard. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I forgot one of my slides. So in terms of uh, just a little bit of background of how we ended up in the mess that we are in, I just thought I'd have a little squiz at what the history of plastics were. Um, so plastics are a wide range of synthetic or semi-synthetic materials that use polymers as a main ingredient. So it's a pretty broad definition, right? The first synthetic polymer was invented back in 1869 
as a substitute for ivory. So it was, it was produced with good intentions, which is somewhat of an irony given the topic today. At the time, the discovery was seen as a savior of the elephant and the tortoise, and that plastics could protect the natural world from the destructive forces of human need. In 2021, global plastics production was estimated to be over 400 million metric tons. Humans began producing plastic on the onset of the 20th century, and since then, there have been 5 billion tons of plastic waste. And that graph over there sort of shows where we're headed with plastic. Obviously, it's all built up. And where is it going? Well, we hear quite a bit about it ending up in the ocean, so I thought I'd have a quick peep at that. And there are approximately 269,000 tonnes of plastic in our ocean, which, you know, is a disgrace, isn't it? The Great Pacific Garbage Patch is approximately 1.6 million square kilometres in area. So you can sort of see the scale of that relative to the US there in that picture. What we haven't really discussed much as a community is, you know, what about in the land? You know, what's it like in the soil? And that's what Susie's topic is about today. So now, Susie, I feel with some confidence I can pass over to you. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, it's great to be here talking to everyone today. So let's um, move on to the next slide. So I, I did a bit of an activity in preparation for this. I took a picture, well, I aimed to take a picture of every single piece of plastic I touched in one day, but actually I, I think in retrospect, this is only about 80% because I know there were some things that I, I missed and it was too late to go back. But I, I've got it here because every single piece of this plastic um, at some point will end up as waste. Um, and I'm, you know, relatively typical. In fact, I'm someone who's trying to reduce my plastic usage, so I'm probably down the low end. And so if you think of my plastic use and, and what I interact with every day, multiplying that by every day of my life and then multiply that by every person on the planet, I think it gives quite a good visual understanding of how big um, our plastic issue is and how much we're creating on a daily basis. So next slide, please. So as we all know, we're, we've all heard about this sort of plastic, the plastic that's ending up in the ocean. And, you know, it really is having a big impact there. Um, we've seen and heard about, you know, pictures of birds being opened up with their guts filled um, with plastics and, and all sorts of um, sort of horrible images. And there's quite a big effort on understanding the extent of it and doing something about it. But what we haven't heard as much about, and if we could have the next slide, please, is microplastic and soil. And so today I want to talk through the situation of what we do know and why it's just as big a problem. It's not that the um, issue in the ocean isn't big. It is really big. It's that soil, um, the problems with microplastics in soil, really I think need to be raised up to a similar level to what's going on in the oceans. So I wanted to give you a bit of an idea of the size of our problem with a bit of data too. So we've got 368 million metric tonnes of um, plastics have been produced annually and it's expected to double by 2040, which really, you know, isn't that far away. Um, very little of our plastics are recycled or incinerated, as in so therefore they're no longer with us. Um, most of them have accumulated in the landfills or somewhere in the environment. And the thing with plastics is we know that they're persistent in the environment. So once they're there, they're going to stay there. They might break down into smaller and smaller pieces, but they're going to stay in the environment and stay potentially having an impact. So next slide, please. So um, this is just to give you an idea of where the plastic is coming from. Um, and you'll see the... the um, the numbers on the other side, on the left-hand side, are a little bit different to the previous slide, and that's because this slide includes the plastics that are still in use. And you can see that the majority of our plastic has been discarded. Um, but I think it's it's interesting that definitely packaging, which is where we're putting quite a lot of emphasis on reducing the amount of um, packaging, is our biggest source of plastics. It's almost half of the plastics that get out 
into the environment. Um, I'm also I'm going to talk a little bit about agriculture and water and wastewater wastewater treatment um, at different times throughout today, and they do fit in those other sectors, but. Um, and even though that's quite small, I think you'll see as I go through why they are important beyond their total volume that they're producing. So to give you an idea of the total um, annual emissions, so in aquatic environments, rivers, lakes and the ocean, various different estimates are between um, 9 to 23 million tonnes entering into our rivers, lakes and the ocean every year. And when we look at the terrestrial environment, it's actually on par or a little bit bigger. And I, I normally when I see these sort of values being talked about, people go, well, the terrestrial environment is really important because it starts in the terrestrial environment and it ends up in the ocean. And that is true. That is an important issue. But a lot of it stays in the terrestrial environment or stays in the terrestrial environment long enough to have an impact in the terrestrial environment. So what I want to do today is talk about that direct impact that microplastics are having in the terrestrial environment and why we need to be paying more attention to it. Next slide, please. So this is just quickly looking at some of the main sources. Um, so we've got microplastics coming from tyre abrasion, um, ending up in the environment. City is a big source with it coming from waste, uh, packaging, clothing. Um, there's a whole lot around agriculture that put plastic mulching in here, but there's, I'll, I'll talk about some different ones later. Um, sewage treatment is a big source and is one of the sources into agriculture. Um, and composting too is a big potential source. And they're drawing on a lot of that urban, um, urban waste is ending up in our compost. Uh, next slide, please. So firstly, I thought I should actually go back and talk a little bit about what are microplastics. So there's a little bit, it's, it's not 100% defined, but we seem to be coming to a consensus around microplastics are pieces of plastic, particles of plastic that are smaller than um, 5,000 micrometer, which is half, uh, sorry, five millimetres. Um, also, there are nanoplastics, which again, the definition of that's not exactly defined here. It's 0.1 micrometer. I've um, seen it defined at a number of ranges around there, but they're basically the very, very small um, plastics. And when I use the word microplastic today, I'm actually going to be including nanoplastics in it. But nanoplastics, because they're so small, they're right at the edge of what we can measure. And so we're only just starting to get information down at that size range of less than 0.1 of a micrometer or less than 100 nanometers. Um, next slide, please. So the other thing to really consider when we're talking about microplastics is that there's two main types. There's the primary microplastics. So they're microplastics that are, have been uh, created as a microplastic. And so the example here is like little um, microplastic beads in a personal care product. And then there we also have secondary microplastics. And that's when the plastic started as something bigger, like here a plastic bottle or a plastic bag. And either before it gets into the environment or when it's pieces of plastic that are smaller than that five millimetre upper bound of what we consider microplastics. Different to why we're really gross size plastics because once they're in the environment they will break down rather break down to seed away next slide please so um i do not expect you <laughs> to um really take in all this slide but I, I have it there to show you that microplastics are actually quite complicated so in some ways they're like pfas you know we, we've all been talking about pfas for a few years now there's thousands of pfas chemicals how can we come up with overall consensus about them and manage them in, an, in a relatively easy way now microplastics there are many types of microplastics like polyethylene polystyrene polypropylene etc but the thing about microplastics too is that there's a whole lot of other characteristics that can impact the impact that can affect the impacts that they have on the environment. So things like the shape of the microplastics, the size of the microplastics, um, their chemical composition, their, whether they're solid state or whether they're soluble or not. And so all of this ends up um, 
meaning that we have a diversity of impacts and it's harder to work out how we're going to manage it, them and how to set thresholds in the environment. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so let's start, talk now about microplastics in soil. So what are the main sources? So this was a study that was done, um, came out in 2020, and they looked at all the studies that have been done that had measured the concentration of microplastics in soil. And the two different slides are studies that had measured them in particles per kilo and then studies that had measured them in milligrams per kilo on the right-hand side. And the, basically the big takeaway from this is that there's a big range in every different, we have like plastic mulching, sewerage, um, road and tyre wear, straight directly from litter, ponding, and then multiple different sources and also ones where they hadn't said where the source was. And what you can see, I think, is that we've got multiple orders of magnitude in each different um, source and um, up to around the sort of 1 million particles or even up to 100 million particles per kilo of soil, which if you think about it is kind of mind boggling how much that can be in some heavily um, microplastic contaminated soils. Um, but we're not really seeing differences too much between the different types. They all have the potential to be high and there's all the potential to be low. I also just wanted to mention we've had a big study um, actually by the led by the now Chief Environmental Scientist of um, EPA Victoria on microplastics in Australian house dust. And so a lot of that also ends up in soil um, as well. And so I just wanted to mention it because they found that almost 40% of the dust particles in our houses are actually microplastics. You know, they're coming off our clothing. If, if you look at like all the different plastics that we have in our house are releasing these microplastics over time. They found that it varied a lot between 22 up to over 6,000 um, microfibers per meter squared per day deposited as dust. Um, and this is really important because people spend up to 90% of their time indoors. And um, if you do the calculations, I, I do it um, with a class to look at exposure when I'm teaching. And even people who consider themselves to be outside people often end up at close to that 90% because we are spending you know, so much time sleeping and things inside as well. So it's a really high exposure for us. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so how much um, sort of microplastics are we finding in soil um, globally in different land uses? Again, are we seeing different concentrations depending on what the land use is? And I think you can see here, it's a similar sort of thing. There's, there's not as many studies when you take it down and aggregate it up by the different land uses, but the first three are related to agriculture. We've got agriculture, horticulture, and then grasslands, uh, pastures. You can see again, we've got multiple orders of magnitude up to sort of 100,000 particles. It's a little bit lower in pastures. They probably don't have as many, um, you know, they're not as intensely managed. Um, and then when it's when it's fallow agricultural land, you might think that it would be lower, but the few studies have tended to find it as higher numbers of particles. Forestry is quite high, and this may be because of um, biosolids in a number of countries. Um, the other thing I think we should um, realise too is often these soils were studied because they were potentially microplastic contaminated. They wanted to find out what the extent was. So it is a little bit biased. It does show us the range, but it's not necessarily um, representative of the proportion of soils that are that high. Um, and then we also have a lot of studies where they couldn't tell what the land use was. Um, okay, so I wanted to just do, say a little bit about microplastics in agricultural soils and why I think they're important. So if we go back to the sectors, it's actually, you know, it's included in that other, it's quite a low source. But the thing is, a lot of the microplastic waste from agricultural soils stays in agricultural soils. Also, we have these external sources coming in. So biosolids and compost are both two and, and also um, treated wastewater are also two sources that aggregate up microplastic waste from the environment. And then when it's added to agricultural soils and potentially forestry soils as well, 
it then tends to be a sink for them. So we have high exposure, even though they're relatively low production, and it tends to stay there. And then the other thing, of course, is that agricultural soils is there's a direct line to exposure to humans because it's where most of our food comes from. And so there's the potential for it to be entering the food chain and entering um, and impacting on us there. And you can see I've just written down a few of the different sources there for um, microplastics in agricultural soils. Okay, thanks, Richard. Okay, so let's look at the impacts that microplastics have on the environment. So this is, I thought it was quite a good summary. I'm mainly going to talk about um, the soil physical properties and soil chemical properties here, and then later we'll talk about the animals and the plants and microorganisms. Um, and, and just a note that I, I got this out of a paper and they've actually got their soil physical properties and soil chemistry um, back to front, I realised, after I'd sent the slides into HydroTerra. Um, so our soil, chem our soil physical properties on the right, microplastics can have an impact on things, a lot to do with how water moves through soil. They can um, clog up pores um, and so reduce water movement. Um, they can, depending on the size and the, and the pore structure in the soil, they might even increase water it's movement. It's, it's quite a, um, you know, it depends on the soil. One of those, it depends on the soil ones. And then for soil chemical properties, they can, um, they've been shown to impact soil pH, soil nutrients and bioavailability, overall soil fertility, and then soil enzymes, which is actually really a measure of microbial processes happening in soils. Okay, so let's move on and look at, um, I think I've got plants first. We can go to, the, yeah, okay. So, um, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of a faux pas here with a slide with a lot of information on it, but I think as I'm going to talk through it and I think you'll be able to see how it really illustrates the issues we have. So each one of these slides, it's um, measuring the effect of the particular parameter that's been measured, which is up the top. So for plants, it's got the length of the roots that got up the top going from left to right, the length of the roots, the, the biomass of the roots, the length of the shoots, the biomass of the shoots, chlorophyll, so that's photosynthesis, um, germination, then antioxidant stress and oxidative stress um, filling out down the bottom. Now, the effect, all you need to know is that the, where the effect is, is roughly about sort of like the average of what the studies are. And then it's showing a 95% confidence for the range. And if that if it's on the red dotted line that you can see going down, that means that there's no effect of microplastics. You don't get any difference to in a situation where you didn't have microplastics. If it's to the left, it means it's a negative effect. And if it's to the right, it means it's a positive effect. And so this is a meta-analysis that looked at all the research. It was published in 2022, so it's pretty up to date. And I think you can see that we've got a cons pretty consistent effect where even though there's quite a lot of variation, we're, in most things, we're picking up negative impacts of microplastics on plants, whether it's their growth or, um, you know, various physiological ones. Now, you might look at the, the um, antioxidant and oxidative stress right down in the bottom right and be like, oh, most of them are over in the positive. But in this case, the positive means an increase in stress. So it's also bad as well. Um, you can see, though, that there's variation. It's not all situations. Like, for example, the below ground biomass, if um, when plastics are small, it's not having as big an impact. But when they're big, it is. And that's maybe to do with the impacts it's having on soil physical characteristics, like water retention in soil. Um you can also see with the green ones that they're having the ones in the middle we've got polystyrene polyethylene and others so different types of plastics and for some of those characteristics there's definitely a microplastic type effect okay next slide so this is the same um way of presenting it it's from the same paper again they looked at all the research out there and it's on fauna and microbes i think we can see the the impact in general is probably bigger on soil fauna. So this is mostly earthworms and um, springtails that the research has been done on. And across the top, we've got pretty clear negative impacts on survival, on growth, on reproduction, on locomotion, so on their ability to move around. Down the bottom, we've got the antioxidant stress and the oxidative stress. And again, even though that's on the right, that's because it's becoming more stressful to them and they're showing more of that stress. 
Now, microbes are the last two, G and H, down the bottom. And I, I think microbes are interesting because they're showing less effects overall than plants and soil fauna. Um, and you can see that there's, um, particularly for microbial dis diversity, which is number two, if you look right down the bottom, the blue microplastic size is having quite a big effect. And so it's, again, it's when it's bigger that it's having more effects on, um, on microbes uh, for their diversity. Um, and this, again, may be due to a soil physical effect. Um, although if we move over to the richness in the number of microbes, we're not really seeing um, massive big differences because of the plastic size. But it is, we are sort of started seeing in some ways the plastic type is having an effect and in some ways the plastic size is having an effect. So these are all factors we need to take into account. And that there's a pretty clear impacts on plants, soil fauna, and to some extent microbes. Okay, next slide, please. So um, talking about the environment, what about on us? Um, so it's been pretty clearly we're starting to get quite a lot of evidence now that um, microplastics, they can we get exposure by inhaling them into our lungs, by ingesting them, eating them in our food or water. Um, and also sometimes if they're small enough through our skin, and it's having a number of effects. We can get um, inflammatory responses um, and autoimmune responses. They can interfere with our immune system, neurotoxicity. Um, we can have, they can affect our gastrointestinal tract and we can get this oxidative stress. Again, the same as in we're seeing in the soil fauna and we're seeing in the plants as well. And it's just really an indication of stress in all of these different organisms. Thanks, Richard. So what are the modes of action? Well, we get direct toxicity. You know, some plastics, they're just toxic to us or animals or plants, um, like polystyrene is one that's often quite toxic. We can also get physical damage. So there's been um, research that's shown that small um, microplastics and nanoplastics can uh, create physical damage in our lungs and in earthworms they've been shown um, to tear holes in their gastrointestinal tract so we can get that sort of physical impact um, they can also be absorbed chemicals so we can have completely different non-plastic related chemicals that at some stage in the plastics um, movement either through its use or as it's moved through the environment, they've become bound onto the plastic and then they can be released. Um, like for example, when an organism or us eats them and it's going through our digestive tracts, they can be released um, and then be toxic to us. And then another one, which is not so much an issue for humans, but definitely has been shown in soil fauna is um, starvation. And this has been shown in oceans as well, where small enough little critters mistake microplastics for food. They eat them. They feel full but they're not getting the energy and the nutrients and you know if it's bad enough they can end up starving if not they just have poorer health um so what are some of the challenges we face with making decisions around how we manage microplastics so the first one is a lack of data this is um from a publication in 2020 and it shows the number of studies that have been published just looking at the concentration of plastics um, in soils around the world. And you can see it wasn't until, up, up until 2016, we'd only had one study published in the entire world on how, what the concentration of microplastics were in soil. But you can now see it's going exponentially and it stops at 2020. We're now in the like tens of studies every year and, and climbing. So we're fast fixing that data gap. Um, we also have it to do with like in soils, there's only been about five years worth of data on um, organisms in soils and the impacts on them. And we only really know for earthworms and springtails, there's not many other species that we know anything. And of course, there's the same issue that I said, like with PFAS, because we've got so many different types of microplastics and different sizes and different shapes and different, you know, and how, how do we put that all together to come out with an overall view of what's going on and how to manage them and, you know, what the risk is. Okay. Um, measuring microplastics. So measuring microplastics is just a bit of an issue in general, especially as we get down to smaller and smaller sizes. It's an issue for measuring them in the ocean, particularly down in that nano um plastics range it's an issue in the ocean it's an issue in soils but in soils we have an even bigger issue because 
basically you've got to get rid of the soil to be able to see the microplastics and measure them. You've also got to get rid of the organic matter because, of course, organic matter is carbon and plastic is carbon. And so a lot of techniques have trouble differentiating between the plastic and the carbon um, and the organic matter. And then the other thing you can see is there's very few methods that can measure all across the full range. Those ones down the bottom, PYGCMS and the TED GCMS, they're really expensive um, and, you know, not many places have one. We are very lucky to have a PYGCMS in Melbourne Uni that we have access that was purchased um, it was um, in part with um, CAPM support before I joined CAPM. So we, we do have that ability at CAPM to measure right across, but no, not very many places do. And it's, it's expensive when you're getting into those ones, well, all the time, but when you're getting into um, particularly those ones that can do the full range. Okay, next slide, please, Richard. Now, another issue we have, which is another one of these not having enough data, is that almost all the studies on the impacts of microplastics have been done on uh, spherical microplastics. And the reason for that is because you can buy them. You can buy different spheres of known sizes and test them in a controlled laboratory setting. But we know that spheres aren't really what we see out in the environment. We see far more fibres. We see far more, you know, irregularly weathered microplastics. And so we have, we're building up this data, but most of it we're not sure how applicable it is um, out in the real world. And so we need to get more real world, real types of microplastics that we're seeing out in the world, both the shapes, the sizes, and also that they're weathered often out in the world. Okay, next slide, please. The other one is, I keep talking about it, you know, it's, it's one of these complex situations where we've got all different sorts of microplastics, um, different compositions, different sizes, different shapes, different colours. Some of them are composites of different microplastics. How how do we come up with an overall risk-based approach? And this is actually an interesting um, paper because it's starting to look at um, how do we do that for microplastics? And I would love to talk about it more, but we don't have time today. So we're gonna go into the next little bit. Um, so um, mostly today, my aim was to bring awareness to that microplastics are an issue in soil. We need to be doing something about it. But I thought I'd finish up with a bit of like, what can we actually do um, with the issue of microplastics in soil? So for us, we can, you know, of course, reduce, reuse and recycle our plastic use. And Richard, can you just hit the little forward one time? because this is my only animation. So I've got a little grumpy there and I've got recycle in red because as we all know, over the last few years, we've been dis discovering in multiple different ways that the plastics we thought were being recycled aren't being recycled. They're being stored various places. And so while we can technically put it in our recycle bins, it's, it's, it's probably not being that effective. And then the other one, vacuum indoors more frequently. This is one of the studies that came out of um, this is one of the, the outcomes that came out of the microplastics in dust study that was done, that people who vacuumed at least once a week had far fewer microplastic particles depositing on surfaces and so therefore also in the air in their house. So they were probably inhaling less microplastics and that is quite an important um, exposure pathway for us. Okay, next slide. So I think there, I'm, I'm guessing quite strongly that there are multiple people here today in government and industry who are probably far better placed than me to suggest how from a government approach and from an industry approach, we are best to um, approach dealing with microplastics and soil. My main aim today is to get it on the agenda and, and get it being looked at as much as microplastics in our oceans currently are. But I did think I'd, I'd put up just a few sort of ideas. So like I said on the other side, there's in the other slide, there's this issue with the economics of recycling. Like, is it, it doesn't seem to be economically viable, and companies are stockpiling them rather than actually recycling it. There's been ideas put around about like a circular, you know, moving more towards circular economies, and there is starting to be some research coming out on soil remediation, including things like using bacteria. Um, that have the ability, we've found some bacteria that have the ability to eat plastics, um, which is great. And then 
just globally, what we're seeing with government policies is it's mostly around levies, bans and voluntary efforts. So voluntary efforts like in Australia, the phasing out of microplastics in personal care products, voluntary efforts like us putting our recycling in the recycling bin. Um, it tends globally to be emphasising more macro-sized particles like bans on plastic bags and things. Um, it tends to be emphasising oceans. But, and we're also they're starting to see some um, policies globally around microplastics in drinking water. Um, in particular, California at the moment is looking at um, having some policies around microplastics in drinking water. Um, and I, like I said, we also need to look at some risk-based policies. To protect. So most of them is about reducing it and reusing um, plastics, and that's super important, but it's not keeping up with the use and the amount of plastics that are ending up in the environment, both in the oceans and in soils. So I think we also need some risk-based policies to protect human and environmental health. And in particular, I brought out like biosolids, soils, composts, and our um, food. So that's it from me, and I hand over to Richard now to um, give his webinar takeaways. Well, Susie, that was fantastic. <clears throat> Very comprehensive and uh, done in great time too. Uh, very interesting and a bit concerning, I suppose. Well, definitely is. Um, a few takeaways from today's session. I think microplastics are just as big an issue in soil as in our oceans. We know microplastics are harmful to humans, animals, plants and microbes and soil physico-chemical properties. So it's a pretty strong statement right there. Okay, so we know they're having a detrimental effect. Agricultural soils need our attention because they are a microplastic source, sink and exposure route. Our microplastic solutions need to consider terrestrial environments and be risk-based. I think one of the challenges with this whole, you know, what is the risk of plastic is the plastic in itself is made up of multiple compounds. And a lot of the time we do risk-based studies, it's compound specific, you know, and we use doses and look at responses, whereas plastic's a bit of a different beast. Um, also, you know, that, that physical aspect to it, you know, you're sort of lean, leaning into, you know, how we deal with something like asbestos or that sort of thing, you know, it's more of a physical problem. So it doesn't fit nicely with the way we normally measure things with a sensor or with a laboratory. Um, it's, it's requiring a different approach to that monitoring. I think there's going to need to be a fair bit of work around that too. Um, so look, we have heaps of questions today. So we're gonna charge into that. And thanks so much for raising those questions. We have about 17 that came in in the early bird question format. So well done to you early birders. You may well get the last laugh today. Um, so here we go. Question number one. How transferable are the human health issues to wildlife? Uh, so very, um, in part because we can't, you know, we're not going in there and dosing up humans with microplastics and seeing the impact. We're actually measuring it on animal models. So a lot of the information we have is coming from um, lab animals. Um, there's also been an interest in um, information. There's also been some studies done around agricultural animals, so things like cows and sheep, because of course, again, it's it's the potential exposure route for us. So, even though I mainly talked about it from a human perspective, um, definitely, what like the vertebrate animals that we've looked at are having similar impacts. They're often used for the models for how we're working out what's happened in humans and so I think going from like you know rats and mice and rabbits and um, cows and sheep and even I think there's been some studies in chickens across to wildlife um, is you know not not too far a jump so probably the issues are similar. Okay 
next question. Local government's management of FOGO waste. That's kind of more of a statement. <laughs> it's a question. What's your view of <laughs> I know. I'm just laughing. That's a, that's an academic thing. This is this is more of a statement than a question. <laughs> we say sometimes in academic presentations. Um, so um, I, I think it's an issue, and I think they know that it's an issue, and I think they're trying to work out what to do about it. Is my understanding of where they're at, and they're 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 struggling with the sort of issues that I talked about today. And I think the good thing though is that they're struggling with it. Oh, actually, I don't even think that it's so much the local governments directly who are struggling with it. It's the um, companies that then take the waste and compost it, and they're the ones who are dealing with it. I think more than the lo could be could be wrong on that. I, I don't really know the detail, but I know that there are things going on, and that that people want they they want to deal with it, and they're trying to work out how to deal with it. Susie, look. Is it possible that we're, we're too late? Like your numbers are showing a lot of plastic out there in the soil. So um, even if we start stopping, right, what are we going to do about that? Yeah, so I, I think that's a great question. I um, I think it's never too late because, because there's so much going in, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And anything we can do to reduce that is, is beneficial. Um, and that's both in soil environments and in aquatic environments as well. It doesn't, you know, it's the same. Um, but, yeah, it would have been nice if we'd done something 10 or 20, you know, done what we're doing now 10 or 20 years ago and now being at a much better place. But we're not. So let's just do what we can now. Last sneaky question before we go to the next one. So all this plastic in the soil and it's degrading, so it's getting smaller in particle sizes and presu presumably releasing more compounds as it degrades. Are we sort of at a wave of highest toxicity now or do you think with degradation, you know, like sometimes the contaminant path gets worse? Yeah. Uh, do you have that's a feel a, for that? Is, have we that's got a, a good question. Um I, I don't actually have a good direct feel for that, but I would say because of this exponential increase in plastics that it doesn't matter where along that weathering and degradation process. So partly we know that the smaller it gets, the more toxic it is in general. Um, but, you know, I saw there's, as I showed you, there's some differences in that, whether it's to do with physical or biological impacts. But in general, the smaller it gets, the more toxic it is. So in big part of weathering, is it breaking down smaller and smaller? So from that point of view, no. Um, but from the point of view of chemicals leaching out and things like that, um, presumably there would be some level at which we reach peak that. But we're continuing to add more and more fresh, more and more and more fresh plastics. So I don't think that we'll see the peak of that for a long time either. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. So question number three, potential role of microplastics to act as carriers for microbial pathogens and viruses, implications for their persistence? Yeah, now this is a great question and this, I have to admit, has me a little bit stumped. I mean, I think we do know that um, microbial and, and, and viruses, as mentioned there as an example too, we do know that they do like hitch rides on particles through the air. Um, and so I can't see why microplastics would be any different. Um, we know that they bind chemicals. And so I, I yeah, I, I can't see. I mean, I think particularly with like viruses, they're not, when they're outside of their host, they're not sentient. So it's more the size and the shape and, and the physical properties of it that means that they can hitch a ride rather than that they're choosing where they want to go. So I would imagine that, I would imagine, and I don't know, um, that that this could definitely happen. And it, and it could either, I don't know what impacts it would have on persistence, but it could definitely maybe is part of, um, could help with dispersal. Maybe, maybe. I'm not, I would definitely not quote me on any of that. I'm really just guessing. Educated guess. Too late, it's recorded, Susie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. 
Um, effects of microplastics on the soil microbiome. Is there an interruption to function? Yeah, so this is a good question. And I, it's very hard to keep up with the microplastic research. There's, so, there's starting to be so much. It's going exponential now. And I, I can't recall a paper that's directly been on the soil microbiome, but you did see those that data that I had for like microbial diversity. And for what they were able to look at in the meta-analysis, there definitely are impacts, but it doesn't seem to be as big as on, um, you know, more like earthworms and um, things like earthworm springtails, those those more soil invertebrates, but there are impacts, um, yeah. So on those earthworms, you mentioned that the plastic's tearing up their gut. Uh, so is that um, widespread? Like, are we actually seeing that in, obviously worms are an important part of productivity with the soil, yeah. saying mass extinctions of worms or is it a, a minor component um well this is one of the things so we are seeing less and less like i think people have heard about things like insect armageddon and again this is one of the things we're mainly paying attention to the insects that are in the air but the invertebrates some of them are insects and some of them are other types of um little um critters that are in the soil um we're getting reducing numbers and reducing diversity of them and it's not been looked at in the same way. And, uh, yeah, I think there's a decent chance that microplastics could be part of that. There's also, you know, habitat destruction, loss of organic matter, climate change. You know, we've got a whole host of other contaminants, a whole host of things, but definitely microplastics could be playing a part, you know. Okay. That's a bit dark there, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> is there international consensus on the analytical method for microplastic analysis and reporting? And the answer is no. We we don't even we don't have it, it's we're we're still especially um, so it's in general whether you're doing it in water or soil, but particularly in soil, there's this flourish of trying to get better and better methods because of this issue that we have to get rid of the organic matter and rid of the the rest of the solid matrix as well to be able to have like robust methods and because we're down at the edges of where a lot of the equipment that people have access to can measure and it's expensive like people are literally going through and like finding each particle and and measuring it like doing software on it but measuring it and and finding out they might have to put into two pieces of equipment to measure the size versus the composition and it's um you know we're not at a time we're not at a stage where we've got robust and quick and cheap methods um for it it's sort of a common problem right we try to measure impacts on the environment and it might take us 10 years to work it out. Meanwhile, you know, damage keeps going on. It might exactly. be just yeah. start managing and, you know, dare I, it's not a good thing for Hydro Terror to say, but he's up on the measurement. <laughs> um, just, just get on with it. Um, yeah. Next, um, this is a good one. Should we be doing incineration rather than landfill? And can this be a way that is not harmful to the environment? Yeah, I think this is a good, this is a really good question. And again, I'm not sure. I think this would be something you'd have to do like a life cycle analysis on. Um, because, yeah, you can have scrubbers and things, but then there's all, all these impacts. Like, I mean, depending on the landfill, like, is it is it properly lined? Is it, there's all these issues. So, I think, I think it's a good question and I think it's something we should look at. Like we, we shouldn't be accepting the status quo and we should be going like, right, what are all the solutions, the potential solutions, and then we should be working out like quantitatively what, what are the best possible solutions. And, you know, maybe in some circumstances we should be looking at incineration or maybe not. I'm, I'm not sure. It's a bit tricky to answer when we're still working yeah. out what the impacts of all those plastics are right so yeah and they do relate like they're releasing chemicals like potentially toxic chem chemicals like vinyl chloride and things like that when they get incinerated so it, it's okay. 
yeah, we have to be careful. Be careful. Okay. Next question number seven. Are there any proposed health investigation levels for plastics in soil? Um, so my understanding is, so talking about in Australia, is more that um, our EPAs are at the level of working out how to develop health investigation levels more rather than that they have health investigation levels, like that they're on the case, but they're not at the point of um, like, you know, putting out draft ones or something like that. That's my understanding. I'm not necessarily up on every single EPA around Australia though. Um, and can Enviro Labs quantitatively analyse or report concerns? There are a few in Australia, like commercial laboratories that can measure microplastics. Um, it's very labour intensive. Um, and then there are like research labs like ours that do it. And I know that there have been circumstances where people would have normally just gone to a commercial lab, but where they've come to us because it really is in its infancy of being um, worked out how to do it. Is it actually possible to develop a health investigation level with such a broad category as microplastic? I mean, you look at all the other health criteria, you know, we might group it and say heavy metals, right? Yeah. And underneath that, the actual health criteria isn't based on heavy metals total. It's based on arsenic or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, why do we think we can do it for plastic? Um, I, that's a, that is a good question. So I think part of it is, you know, we'll, just like part of what might come out of this is new ways of developing risk, the same as we're, we've been doing with things like, um, you know, carbon pollution from climate change. There's a whole lot of different types of greenhouse gases that can have an impact. And then, you know, and they worked out a way like carbon equivalents. And we're doing that a little bit with PFAS. And so maybe it'll be something like that. Maybe it's about working out like what are the sizes that are really the issue or what are the types of plastic, the same as we've done with PFAS. You know, we're really concentrating on PFOS and PFOA and they're the ones that were discovered first and there's lots of them out in the environment and we're moving into some of the other types of PFAS now and so we, you know there might be a similar sort of approach maybe with microplastics where we start with the ones that there's lots of or the ones that we know are having big impacts and then build up more sort of some sort of matrix way of dealing with it yeah it's not easy though okay no. question number eight remediation of microplastics from the soil environment so I did briefly mention that there are some methods that are starting to be developed. They're looking at like bioremediation. There are some microbes that it's been discovered. They can eat microplastics. Um, I think there are also like, depending on the size, if you're not looking microplastics, if it's bigger, you can do, or the big end of microplastics, you can do sieving and things to get rid of it. Um, and then there's like some thermal techniques, but like with other thermal techniques, they tend to have a pretty big impact on your soil. So it depends what your um what you can do with the soil afterwards if you're starting to go down those thermal techniques it takes out a lot of good stuff doesn't it thermal yeah soil, you're starting with a sterile solution right yeah um number nine would you please also discuss microplastics in air and lungs I think we've touched on it. But, uh, yeah, so we have touched a little bit. So um, definitely finding microplastics in air. It's not. This is not my area of expertise, so I'll probably speak a little bit more generally than um, someone who was their expertise. We're definitely finding microplastics in air. We know they're travelling distances through the air. Again, they're, they're particles, so similar to, you know, a standard like PM10 and, and that sort of um, situation. And with lungs, we know that... Um, I can't remember the exact size, but if microplastics are small enough, they will travel through the lining of the lungs and they can do physical damage to the lungs um, and they can then also get into the bloodstream. Um, so, yeah, definitely there's impacts. We, we don't want to be breathing in microplastics if we can help it, but, like, from that microplastic, microplastic in-house dust study, we all are. Yeah, it sort of makes you wonder about carpet, doesn't it, and what it's made of. And oh, yeah, carpet is definitely one of the, the fibres yeah. yeah. Uh, number 10, sediment fencing, eco options. So 
I guess this, we're looking at other options rather than plastic-based ones. Yeah, so that's that's what that means too. Again, this is more a statement than a question. So I'll have, have a go. So I guess, yeah, you mean like other options than using plastic to do the fencing. And um, that is a great question. I guess, it, again, it would depend. I'm, I'm coming up with this off the top of my head. Um, I... I would think, I mean, we are starting to come out with some biodegradable plastics. And so depending on how long you need the sediment fencing for, but the issues we're finding is that some of the biodegradable plastics, the way they biodegrade is by becoming microplastics rather than actually degrading. So we don't want to be switching across like that. We want ones that actually do break down, but within a time frame that's okay for that sediment fencing. Um, yeah, and then other options... Again, I guess depending on the length of time you need it, you might be able to use some organic methods maybe. Um, yeah, depending on what it is that you're trying to do there. Okay. I think there are some already in existence. Um, uh, question number 11. Interested in migration of microplastics in different sorts of soils? particularly those on riverbanks and former waste. Yeah. So this is this the, the physical impacts, so feel like physical movement of microplastics through soil is only, it's in more infancy than looking at the impacts on um, soil fauna and, and microbes. There's even less. Um, but what we do know is there's been a few studies that are showing it ending up in uh, groundwater. And so it's going, it's traveling down through the soil and getting into the groundwater. Um, so I could imagine, I, I guess the question about riverbanks is, does it end up in the river? And so it could, again, by sort of traveling through the soil, but also if it's on a riverbank, you can just get erosion of that riverbank and it directly ending up and you can get overland flow and it ending up in the river. Um, and former waste disposal, um, I'm not I'm not aware of direct studies. You know, there's there's starting to be so much literature; it's hard to keep up. Um, if you've been if you're in the ocean space, there's been so much literature for years that it's hard to keep up. But in soil, I'm I'm glad the research is is really starting to take off. But so waste disposal again, I think it depends on things like the liners, um, both above. At the top, like how, like if the clay liners and things get broken over time or not. And I mean, the same sort of issues that we have with all sorts of contaminants and in um, in our landfill, basically. A lot of landfills are made of plastic, with plastic membranes these and days. And if they've got plastic yeah. membrane, yeah, then as the membrane breaks down, it's part of the mm. issue. Yeah. Um, all right, next question. How can microplastics enter plants? Yes. Yeah, so um, part of the impacts on plants, they don't even need to enter the plants. It's these physical impacts that it, and chemical impacts that it's having on soils indirectly impacting them. And then they can go, if they're small enough, they just go in through the plant roots and that's been demonstrated to happen. Um, and something that I actually thought of as I was writing this that I should go and have a look is if there's been any research to see if, um, microplastics can come in through plant leaves too if they deposit on the leaves from the atmosphere. And again, I think that would be size dependent. Uh, definitely, um, we know that various um, metals and things can enter through plant leaves and and particles they just need to be small enough to get in through. I think there's a question, I think one of the new ones was around stomata and it's all about the size. If, depending on the size of the stomatal openings in plants and the microplastic, if it's big enough, they can go in there and they could, yeah, potentially block it if they then don't move further into the plant. It's interesting that the impact on, you know, that, that conductive tissue, like whether it can just actually block the, the yeah. water up the plants too. Yeah, exactly, uh, through their roots, yeah. Question number 13, do the sources of microplastics differ between soil and aquatic environments? Yeah, so I guess um, the, the answer, I guess the broad answer is yes. Like in, in aquatic environments, we've got a lot of these aquatic sourced microplastics. So things like that come from shipping and fishing nets and all of this sort of thing, which is not, I mean, you might have it along the shoreline, but it's that's not really an issue in um, on land. The other thing is that microplastics from land, there's 
quite a few studies now that have come out and shown that microplastics from land are moving into our rivers and then into our oceans and and depending on how close they are also just directly into the oceans so um some of the sort like it, it might take longer to get there but there's similar um sources from that point of view um and then i mean lit up plastic you know, a lot of there was a lot of our plastic is packaging, and a lot of that is it not being disposed of properly, um, and so and not being disposed of in a secure way in landfill or incinerated, and so then it can get out and get anywhere. And then of course we've also got plastics moving through the atmosphere, like I said, and so they can come from land and end up in the ocean too. So there are some that are different, but there's a lot that are the similar, and diff- there might be different proportions as well. It's interesting, um, the Yarra River Keeper Association did this study on sources of plastics in the Yarra River, and they found that 50% of the uh, of the plastic was polystyrene, and it was actually coming from the construction sector predominantly. Uh-huh. So it was actually, um, you know, when you carry around I know, glass and other building products, it's wrapped in quite yeah. reasonably substantial polystyrene sheets. So it's interesting, like they've actually gone out and quantified it and said 50% of the problem in the era is that one source, right? So a clear that's way to manage that one wouldn't be too hard, right? So Yeah, and I think that's part of the going back to like how do we manage it. Part of it is working out like what are the biggest sources, what are the biggest exposures and dealing with them, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, good answers there, Susie. Uh, we've got heaps of questions coming in. It's sort of like uh, painting oh, the bridge. We're not going to keep up. Um, how do you remove microplastics in soil? That's a bit like the one about remediating them. Yeah, um, I think we've answered that one. All right. There's one way to catch up. Number 15, what can we expect in terms of regulation of micro microplastics? Uh, I can't read that last bit. Uh, but going forward. Going forward, yeah. Um, so I I think at the moment the emphasis really is on that reduce, reuse, like, you know, the Victorian government's just banned a new suite of single-use plastics. At the moment I think we're at that stage. Um, then I think we will probably see, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in our EPAs, so, I mean, this is I think probably a better um, question for them in a way, but I'm I, I I know that they have microplastics as priorities and they're trying to work it out. So I think what I can say is that in that beyond, we are going to get regulations that we around the environmental risk of them. When I don't I you know I don't know, but I can see that it's heading in that direction. Okay. The next one's an interesting one. It's sort of you know how the different particle sizes are bracketed and I think your slides might have touched on this but what is the percentage of nanoparticles out from micro particles um, and are any of these releasing nanoplastics into the air um, so the second one is yes we like there's been a few studies in air and we know that there are you know micro and nano well, more down the nanoplastic um, or, and the smaller microplastic range, um, the sort of proportion that they make up, excuse me, um, I would want to say there's probably a few, there's be a few studies that have quantified both. Um, but like I said, it's it's down the edge of what we can quantify at the moment. And I think we're just discovering it. And what we're discovering is every time we get better at measuring it, we find more and more nanoplastics. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say at this, and, and I think it's also a, a moving um, sort of line because, again, the longer we've had plastics in the environment, the more of them kind of weathered and broken down into that nanoplastic range. So it's, yeah, it's a bit of a moving moving line. I suppose there's potential that the nano is more dangerous than, you know, the micro. Um, and that's the, that is the issue, yeah. So in that context, do you have a view on biodegradable plastics yeah so i don't know particularly about biodegradable mulch per se what i know is there have been issues with biodegradable plastics 
that they're not really biodegradable. Like the um, the standards are actually that they break down into microplastics, not that they actually degrade away. Um, and so if that's the case, you know, in some ways maybe they're worse. Um, I do know, though, that there are, not just talking about mulches, like um, we're collaborating with um, the Cambridge University and there's some engineers there who for glitter have developed these um, micro the micro crystalline cellulose um, glitter that they can heat treat and it will you know for as long as you need your glitter it'll be fine but then when it goes out into the environment it's just made out of cellulose so it, it breaks down and so I think there's a lot of potential in general for biodegradable plastics more moving into those treated um, microcelluloses and or depending on how big you need it so that they really they actually are breaking down um, chemically not just physically it's really hard for the standards to keep up with yeah. the knowledge isn't it I mean that's a yeah, classic definitely. case of um, you know, fast track that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so do you feel you've answered 17? Does biodegradable mulch pose a risk to human health? Um, yeah, I think as much as I... Oh, I guess uh, what other alternatives are like, you know, organic mulches? Um, and I, there's been a few studies that are showing out that coming out now that they're showing that while plastic mulch in the short term can have benefits, in the long term it actually can start to decrease yield. So it's maybe not the panacea that it was thought to be in, in yeah. some types of agriculture. It's interesting. Um, in another life I did quite a few studies on mulch in agriculture. There's a lot of other benefits beyond, you know, just the moisture retention. Exactly. You get... You're getting a, a reservoir of good organics to come down into the soil profile. So yeah, nutrients. Traditional mulch is probably a better go. Yeah. All right. Goodness, we got through the early bird uh, questions. Well done, everybody. Now, Susie, I need to let you know we're about seven minutes over time and we have 23 questions left to answer. So are you willing to stay a little bit longer? Yeah, let's have a go at it, Richard. All right. Uh, just before I do, I'd just like to formally thank Gordon Carter for preparing the slides that we've looked at so far. Really appreciate it. And would like to welcome Mary Carter, Gordon's mother, to the webinar today. Now, let's move right along. So Q&A. William Gordon. Hi, Susie. Slide 29. What is the scale on the bottom of the charts? Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. I can't even remember what slide 29 was. <laughs> um, Will, I'm sorry, but maybe on the recording you'll be able to interrogate that slide. And um, Yeah. And if you, want, uh, if you want to email me, I think my email's right at the end. If you want to email me, I can tell you what the slide was. And I'm sorry that I um, didn't give that info okay now i think you referred to this before so andrew dougal wants to know do microplastics block stomata interfering yeah, with respiration answered that one so the answer was you weren't sure or i weren't sure but i could see that if they're the right size they could yeah yeah okay jackie daly any estimates on the proportion of microplastics originating from biodegradable plastics? So I, I don't know the answer, but just as a like citizen, I'm not seeing that much in, in shops and things that are claiming to be biodegradable. So I'd imagine it's relatively small, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm, it's just a guess. Okay, so you're saying just as much coming from... Well, it's probably because there's so much for out of the other. Well, yeah. that's, mm. yeah. But if you were to look at uh, conventional plastic versus biodegradable, uh, what you'd expect a lot more of the uh, sort of nano sized to come out of the biodegradable or you don't really know? Um, yeah, well, if they're biodegradable because they break down faster, that means we're going to get to that nano size faster. Yeah. Uh, depending, you know, depending on the time frame, it may or may not be more. Like if it's long enough for the other plastics to break down to that size, then, you know. But yeah, we might we might be we might be getting to it faster. 
and then we'll see what they do. All right, next question. Running a oh, HEPA, what's a HGPA stand for? Yeah, HEPA fills her. It would reduce the inhalable microplastics. It would be interesting to compare vacuuming, which often resuspends aerosols, and HEPA. HEPA should win. I think, um, Robin, I think, yeah, that's a great point. So Robin is one of my colleagues at the University of Melbourne and she's a CAFM member as well. So she's thinking as she's listening, which I think um, I think that's a great point. And it would be interesting now that, um, you know, there's a number, like in schools and things, they've got all the HEPA filters um, because of COVID. It would be interesting to see if they now have less microplastic fibres in the air. Like if there's a dual benefit of having um, those HEPA so that's different. Robin's talking about vacuums and now I'm bringing that across to like actual HEPA filters that you can have in a room that, and again, it's all based on particle size. They're just removing particles of that in that small size. Um, so it removes viruses. It, it removes, um, it'll, it'll remove plastics that are down there. Yeah. So given um, you mentioned earlier, that there's plastics coming off tires and um, those sorts of sources as well should it becoming part of the suite of things that the EPA is looking at in our air quality you know they typically look at vehicle emissions yeah. and that's a good yeah that's a good question I mean I think um I think this is part of this thing around risk assessment that we really need to be doing working out what the risk is and is it is like is it in inside our homes that the risk is is it outside is it is it a high enough risk that we do need to be measuring it or is it just in certain situations? And so I, I don't think we know the answers yet to be able to say, yeah, you should be going out and measuring it. Do we know if everyone is out there measuring it? That's the question, this one from, next one from Robin. <laughs> um, so I can't, there are people measuring microplastics in air, um, whether or not there's anyone in Australia, I can't remember whether, I've, because again, Robin's our air expert and I'm our soil expert. And so I'm not looking at the air as much, but there may not have been one in Australia. Good chance there hasn't been in Melbourne for sure, I'd say. Um, but I know there are some other groups in New South Wales and Queensland and um, doing quite a lot of microplastics research. So there might have been studies up there. I'm not sure. It sounds like you've put uh, Susie on the spot there, Robin. So maybe yes. uh, you can come back <laughs> with a good job. bit of information for us both. Uh, William Gordon, you can ignore that question above now. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, William. <laughs> okay. Um, Rachel Lancaster, if bacteria eat the plastics, what is the end product? Just carbon? That is a good question. And I think that's part of what the research is around making sure um, that, yeah, you don't end up with a bigger problem than what you had before. Um, again, this is not my direct area of expertise, so I know the research is going on, um, but I am i don't know whether they know that answer yet, but we'd be aiming for, um, yeah, kind of neutral carbon um, compounds, yeah. No, history sort of seems to show, you know, most of these biological degradation paths produce a few uh, hiccups, don't they, in terms of toxicity of the next thing down the chain and exactly, and yeah. So many different compounds. It's going to be a big study to work that out. Um, but a good question. Ah, so Russell Schindler from SampleServe. Hello from Michigan. Ah. Great presentation, very <laughs> informative. So uh, we've got people listening on the other side of the world. There you go, Susie. That's fantastic. International superstar now. Um, Juan Montoya, I've got that right. Beyond bans and policy change, reuse and reduce action. Should we also be pursuing more waste to energy options in Australia? Yeah, so... Um... One, I think, I think, like I said before, I think we should be sort of putting everything on the table and then working out what is the most sustainable options. And so we need to look at it both from the point of view of microplastics 
And, you know, we don't want these unintended consequences where we solve it, but then we're creating a big climate change impact or something as the unintended consequence. So um, I, I definitely think it should be something that we're looking at and, and assessing. All right. Next question uh, from Sadiq Bawa, I think. What is the magnitude of microplastic contamination through irrigation compared to other sources like biosolids, lettering, textile and others? Okay. Um, so I can't remember reading one that's directly in irrigation and I'm assuming this is not wastewater irrigation because there's definitely issues with wastewater irrigation, but this is just water that's come from a river. And I think it depends on, or, or from groundwater potentially, or, you know, like freshwater irrigation sort of, um, I'm, so it depends on the source. Um, I, I've got a little like factoid about biosolids though, because I'm pretty sure biosolids are going to be higher. Um, so there's an author, and I can't remember who the author was, but they compared some two different sets of modeling that had worked out the total amount of biosolids, the total amount of plastics added in biosolids globally every year is more than the total amount of plastics that are on the surface of the ocean in any given year. So it's like staggering how much is in biosolids. Um, and that was, I was going to give that little factoid and, and forgot. So it's great that you asked that question. So I think, um, you know, biosolids are going to win over, um, definitely over irrigation there. And then, um, and, and composting too has, has got the potential to be really high, especially when it's like this FOGO waste and things where, you know, we're not necessarily so good at like, oh, there's the rubber band that's around the shallots that are all wilted and people just chuck that in and, you know, whatever else it is that they they just chuck the whole plastic bag in with the, the shallots that are wilted or I, I don't know what people are doing, but there's lots of plastic getting in there or they just don't care that it's FOGO waste. Like, so, you know, we've got a real issue with our FOGO waste as well. Do you know how much plastic's in the sort of human body on average, right, like now? Oh, yeah, I don't know that. They're founded, though. They're founded in breast milk. They're founded in our blood. Like it's, we've, we've got microplastics. You know, I can pretty much guarantee you and I and everyone watching have, have you know, measurable quantities of microplastics in us at the moment. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right, so Sadiq or Sadiq is also interested in can we use phytoremediation as a method to yeah. remove plastics from soils? So this is a good this is a good question. So I think there's you know when you're talking about phytoremediation broadly, there's a whole lot of different approaches. So if it's phyto extraction that you mean, plants in general, the microplastics have to be pretty small before they're going to absorb them. So you might, um, yeah, it depends on the situation, but they're going to be leaving those bigger ones, which will then break down. But maybe, you know, if it's like sieving combined, there may be a potential there. So, you know, I think it's something that should be looked at. Um, but then, yeah, there's all sorts of phytoremediation. So maybe you're talking more about that, like there's phytoremediation where the plants are used to stimulate the microbes and to have substrates so that you get more microbes that are then degrading, bioremediating the um, the plastics. And so, again, that's another potential area that would be, yeah, good to look at. Okay. Greg Hancock, great talk. Well done, Susie. Where does plastic coatings on surfaces and in particular paints fit into this issue? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, definitely. And I think um, in urban environments, you know, like we've, we've documented that there's high, like um, from house paints, we've got high concentrations of lead, say, in our back garden soils. And um, a lot of that, that lead's coming off paint. So it's going to be, um, you know, little fragments of paint that are the that are the lead that's in the soil often there. So I think, you know, it is there. It's not, um, this is another thing with how we work out that it's paint rather than it's, it's 
in the scale of relatively easy, it's easier to go in and go, it's these compounds. It's harder to go in and go, oh, that means it's plastic. Um, oh, plastic coatings. Oh, no, in particular paints. Yeah, it's paints or it's, is so there's not that many studies that have gone to that level where they're really looking at like not just what is the composition but what is the origin of these plastics particularly in terrestrial environments there's a bit of it happening now in in marine environments so we'll bring we'll be bringing that in into the soil environment and doing more research there will be good Andrew Dougal do we know if it eventually stratifies in the soil as a high concentration layer I don't think we do know, but like I said, we're finding it in groundwater. So we do know that it's moving through, but whether we get um, like bulges moving through, like we get with nitrogen moving through soil and down, I, I don't know. And again, it's going to depend on your soil type and the pore size and the types of microplastics. And um, yeah, so that is, a, I think that's a really good question though. I like this next question. Sadiq said, how do you reduce cross-contamination during analysis? Look like they're everywhere. So a lot of yeah. our, uh, sampling containers. This is, yeah, so sprays. sampling containers, we've got to be careful what we're wearing. Like you don't want fibres coming off your clothes. So we're wearing cotton lab coats and, um, and our gloves, you know, they're plastics. So we make sure that they're like a really distinctive colour and that we're consistently using the same colour. So if it is a particle from them, we can identify it easily. Um, depending on what we do, like we, we do, we make sure things are covered all the time, that except when we really need them to not be, where um, we'll often do it in um, fume cupboards so that it's not you know, the air's been blown off or or, um, or um, biosecurity cabinets too, where it's keeping, you, you know, the, the whole aim of them is to keep the air off um, the off our samples so that we're not getting contamination coming in. Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue. And we do a whole lot of quality control so that if it is coming in, we can pick it up. All right. So Scott Carroll's giving us a bit of wisdom here about uh, incineration versus other. I think it should be, do you know what EFW is? I don't know what EFW is. This is, And oh, I think Scott. this is great that we're getting people with more expertise on the <laughs> main, these issues um, coming in on the bits that they know more about. So as opposed to incineration, various options available with positive outcomes like gasification and pyrolysis yeah. which can be much better than incineration and i guess this is this um waste to energy that um i can't remember who it was but someone else brought up is the gasification i'm assuming yeah that's right so looking at incineration versus recycling i think the other one was mm. um, kathy phillips have there been any studies on the economics of not recycling plastics e.g cost of investigation remediation mm. impact to human health impacts to the environment, et cetera. Would this be likely to make us reconsider economic barriers mm -hmm. to recycling? I think, look, these are so many great questions. That is a great question, Kathy. And I, the answer is I don't know. And I think we need more of this sort of life cycle, whole life cycle. What are the impacts of plastic and, and, and the benefits? You know, that's what you do in, in life cycle assessment and then working out, like, where are the situations where we still have plastics and where are the situations where we don't because the, benef the cost outweighs the benefit. All right. That was a good question. Uh, Robin Schofield's back again. Uh, PM 2.5 is an aggregate pollutant <laughs> um yeah so i guess you're saying robin i think that it's pretty big in the that that's even pretty big compared to some of the microplastics that we're seeing and so oh oh no i know what robin's saying there i think is that you're saying it's it's an aggregate of all particle pollutants so it's not we can't use pm 2.5 to measure microplastics we need if we want to measure microplastics in air we have to measure microplastics in air i think which is a good that's a good point all right now it's uh, five to two i think we'll give it 
five more minutes. Um, this is fantastic to have all those questions. Thank you. Andrew Dougal. There is a global trend to monetize the natural capital of soil. It seems that microplastics would reduce this potential capital value. Is this a liability for someone, e.g. waste collector, household polluter, or plastic manufacturer? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, it depends where we lay the liability, but in general, in our society, it's whoever owns the land that the soil's in. Like that's how we do the audit system. It's whoever owns that property. So I would think that the potential risk is there for property owners. And I'm worried, uh, I'm worried about agriculture farmers and that you know they're then you know they think that they've been doing the right thing they've been doing and that it may end up that there are some issues down the line there um potentially when assessing um industrial sites for reuse microplastics in the future might come up as an issue and this is the thing at the moment there's this uncertainty around well, what is a, what is a soil that's unacceptably contaminated with microplastics? We just don't we don't have values at the moment to be able to say that. So yeah, there's potential in the future for it, and there's the potential just like with other contaminants for it to reduce value. What would be interesting to look at is from the EU perspective. You know, they're coming in with all these um, new, effectively, they're not tariff barriers, but essentially they're going to stop us selling into their markets based on how sustainable ag our agriculture is, you know, so they look at... Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if this one's going to appear in that area. Um, that is, yeah, it could be outside forces that drive before yeah. we get into the policy space on it. Yeah, it's true. Is there any EU, any movement in the EU on regulating this, do you know? There is, I don't think they have, like besides this kind of like let's reduce it, reuse it, levies, it's more at that end still. But there's definitely, there's movement there. And like I said, California's um, getting really close to having concentrations in drinking water. It is amazing how the EU policy is driving quite rapid change, right? And yeah, they do. It's a, it's I mean, a good, it's a good thing, right? Yeah, but, um, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's a, it's a good, you know, in general, it's a good thing, yeah, especially yeah. for the industries we're in. <laughs> yeah, that's true. To, <laughs> <laughs> to be, you know, slightly biased. I'm sure there might be um, people in the audience who have other views. Oh, you <laughs> All right, next one. Kathy Phillips, do you think the positive impacts on microbial diversity and richness shown in some cases in the graphs you showed relate to increases in plastic degrading microbes. Yeah, they very well could be. And this is part of the issue of measuring microbes um, in that way. And so I think there was the question on the microbial um, biome. I think there's good case for going in there and looking at like what are the process, like even though the diversity overall is the same, are we seeing differences in different groups with different functions um so yeah is it like plastic degrading microbes are increasing but maybe the nitrogen cycling ones are decreasing we we don't know when we're measuring it in those aggregated ways all right toby montgomery thanks very much for your presentation he's had to leave us well thanks um thanks so much to everyone who's hanging around we've still got over 100 people here which mm. is Impressive. You're holding a big audience. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine Pagett. Pagett, thank you for this talk. I am part of the Water Keepers Alliance and so interested in the problems on land that affect riverways. So I am on the border in terms of my work as river keeper and the local land coordinator. Are you connected to land care in Victoria? It'd be great to have your presentation at a land care conference as well as our Water Keepers Alliance meetings. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you, Susie? Uh, so I think at the end, my um, email is going to be shown, but you can Google Susie Reichman and I come up I come up top. And so you can get my, my email that way. Um, that's probably best. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on um, 
Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Mastodon. <laughs> if people, and I tend to with LinkedIn, um, especially after an event like this, if, if people who I can see are in the field, even if I don't know them, if you connect with me, I'll connect back with you. So, yeah, LinkedIn or, or direct email. I'm Reichman at unimel.edu.au. And, yeah, it's easy to Google me. There's not many Susie Reichmans. And, uh, Susie's contact details are at the end of the yeah. presentation, which is saved on our website. So uh, you can pick up that um, as well. Yeah. And you can Google Capham as well because there's, there's contact details for Capham on the Capham website. All right, back to questions, Susie. You're not quite off the hook yet. <laughs> sort of are. Do microplastics bioaccumulate in guts or lungs? Um, okay, so I think they both expose they're both pathways by how they get into our body. Um as to whether they definitely, I know they um, sort of can accumulate in the lung lining and the gut lining. A lot of what's going on in the gut, though, is is passing through. And so there's um, a lot of it will move through and it can have those physical, potentially it can have those same sort of physical impacts on us that it, it's been shown to have on earthworms. I think, oh, I think there's been some studies on humans showing similar impacts in, in our gut linings as well, in our gastrointestinal linings. Um, but, oh, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, so, yeah, both. Just wondering, um, Susie, like I'm a little bit partial to cheese and it's typically wrapped in plastic. Is, uh, is that a problem with the direct pathway? Uh, yeah, potentially. And then the other thing is I know that they've shown that there are microplastics in human milk and so presumably it's in cow milk as well. So you could be just directly getting it from the cheese. But don't stop eating cheese because you're also, <laughs> <laughs> you're also getting it from your drinking water and maybe in your celery and your beef and, uh, you know. Uh, although oh. I think it's not mainly in muscles. It's not too bad in muscles, muscle tissues. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, look, we might have to stop it there. I'm sorry. Uh, we've still got 13 questions to answer and we're over two o'clock. Um, wow. But thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. That's been fantastic. And we'll do our best to answer them by email. Um, I would like to say thank you very much to Susie. It's been a fantastic um, presentation and obviously... There's a huge amount of interest and, I guess, concern out there about this. And congratulations to Capham for sort of identifying this as a key issue to be sorted out. Um, so well done. And anyone who's interested in further research in this area or partnering with Capham should contact Susie. They do have industry partnerships program and... Uh, you know, they're going very well as a research organisation, but clearly it's an area that needs a lot more study. So thanks very much, Susie. That's been fantastic and um, really appreciate your time today. And thank you, Richard. And thank you to the audience for such great questions. It's, it's been lots of fun. <laughs>